So hello everyone, and welcome to the final video for EART 27201, Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils, from me at least. After this, I'll be handing over to Rodri, who's covering the sedimentary rocks elements of this course, and you'll also be having a session with my uh, colleague Stefan Schroeder talking about microfossils. But before we um, move on to that, I wanted to finish these um, sessions on macro fossils with uh, this time four videos in which we're going to be looking at in the first two some of the interesting groups that we've not been able to focus on thus far due to lack of time and then we're going to finish by looking at just a, an introduction as to how fossils can help us understand the environment of deposition of rocks so how they can be useful to us as geologists. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the macro fossils element of this course. I certainly enjoyed writing these lectures and recording these videos for you. Um, and I'm sorry that we've had to miss out some major groups, but at least we get this opportunity to cover them now. So without further ado, let's go on to what we have missed part one. And we're going to start by looking at the sponges. So you can see some uh, examples of the sponges in these beautiful prints by, prints by Ernst Haeckel. Um, sponges are animals that are known by the scientific name of periphera. All of them are aquatic, so they live in water, and most are marine, so they live in salty water. Sponges are almost entirely filter-feeding members of the sessile benthic community, so they live on the seafloor and they are generally fixed to the seabed. The vast majority uh, live their lives by pumping large volumes of water through their bodies. So if you think about sponges, as in the things you use to clean stuff, those were originally, well they're often nowadays made of petroleum products, those were originally made of the bodies of these animals. And you can imagine what a sponge is like, right? They're, they're very, um, they're spongy. That's a useful description, isn't it? They are, um, they are very good at absorbing water. And this, uh, allows the sponges, the animals, to filter water through their bodies um, and then filter out nutrients from those. They exist, or there exists within this group, a variety of grades of functional organization of different ways that sponges actually um, make their, their living and uh, extract nutrients. So they're organized to different degrees. Um, they have this unique porous structure that I've already mentioned and a body plan that is um, kind of based at the cellular level of organization. They generally lack symmetry uh, and true differentiated tissues and organs. So they're relatively quote unquote simple creatures. I don't think in any way they are genuinely simple, but what we can say is that they are not as complex as some of the other animals that we've looked at over the, um, the last few weeks of this course. So bear that in mind. When it comes to placing them on evolutionary um, trees, on our phylogeny of animals, they're right here. They're one of the earliest branching members of this clade that later uh, develops into the bilaterian animals, but they predate the origin of those bilaterian animals. There is some precise argument um, about where these fall relative to a group called the comb jellies, which aren't on this tree because we're not sure where those are. But for all intents and purposes, you can uh, remember that the periphera, uh, the sponges, are the earliest branching members of this lineage. And that will serve you well. They are generally seen as the first major clade of animals to diverge. They have a Precambrian fossil record, which is disputed. People are arguing at the moment over whether the structures that we're seeing in Precambrian um, rocks represent fossils or not. And the same is true of potential chemical traces of sponges in the Precambrian. On the balance of probabilities, we can say that the first sponges uh, possibly appeared in the late Proterozoic as clusters of flagellate cells. What we can say for sure, however, is that sponges, along with the corals, are the major components of both modern and ancient reefs. That's a, com a, um, a statement that we're fairly confident about, and we're fairly confident that these, um, the, the sponges uh, were fairly significant members of reef communities by the Ordovician at the latest. 
the evolution of the main groups of fossil sponges is intimately related to their participation in reef ecosystems, as you can see from this in image. So the, the cnidarians, these are our corals, are shown here, and all of these are different um, groups of sponges or closely related organisms. And as you can see, these different groups are successful at different times based on reef building at that particular time. And indeed, they are most successful in times of major reef building across the Phanerozoic. Sponge reefs were dominated during most of the Phanerozoic by calcareous grades developed convergently across the phylum. So there were lots of different groups of sponges that have developed calcareous hard parts, so hard parts made of calcium carbonate. Um, that's true for much of the Phanerozoic, but I also wanted to highlight that um, siliceous, siliceous, I should say, sponges were important reef builders, uh, mainly during the Mesozoic. So these are things, are uh, sponges that make their hard parts out of silica rather than out of calcium carbonate. The fossils of sponges are often found in the forms of just the hard bits, for example, the spicules, which are the structural elements by which many sponges make their, their bodies and their hard parts. So those are often found as disaggregated um, bits. So that's a very brief introduction to the sponges. Let's move briefly onwards. Well, I say briefly, let's move quickly onwards and let us look at the Bryozoa. So once more, we've got some beautiful images of Bryozoa by Ernst Haeckel. Bryozoans are colonial invertebrates with lophophores. In fact, they're the only phylum of animals which we know of in which all species are colonial. So all species form these colonies. Many of their skeletons are beautifully designed. So as you can see in this image here, these are colonies of bryozoa and each individual, and um, these are called zooids, have this really beautifully designed, um, designed, beautifully evolved, obviously I should say, um, uh, form here. So these colonies, as I mentioned, are comprised of individuals called zooids, and these are generally really quite small. They're commonly less than one millimeter in diameter. diameter. They commonly display marked non-genetic variation. So um, these groups can be genetically similar, but they can vary um, between colonies. And they're found across a wide range of different environments. Each zooid, um, so each individual, has a separate mouth and anus, and it has a circular or horseshoe-shaped lophophore. Um, so one of these specialized feeding organs that's equipped with a ring of eight to 100 tentacles. The primary function of most of these zooids is to capture food. So these creatures are, these colonies are filter feeders, but some of the zooids specialize in defense or reproduction or sediment removal. So removing sediment from your bits. And as you can see, the colonies have a wide variety of beautiful different shapes. Um, these colonies fragment relatively easily after death. Uh, I would also highlight these, these are mostly marine animals. Where they sit on the Tree of Life has actually been, for a long time, a matter of significant debate. And if you re read any older textbooks, actually, essentially all bets are off. They can be placed virtually anywhere on this tree. But recent decades, using both the morphology of these animals, but also their, their DNA, their molecules, have helped us be more certain that they are placed somewhere in the Lophotrochozoa. And they may well be, in terms of the groups that you can see here, the sister group to the brachiopods. So nowadays, we're fairly confident that this is the case and they, they, are, they belong within this group that's defined based on the feeding appendages, but also on the embryology of these creatures as well as their DNA. The oldest bryozoans appear in the lower order visions. So they have a relatively uh, early start in terms of the Phanerozoic. And it's very likely a soft-bodied bryozoans existed during the Cambrian period, but they, those um, soft-bodied creatures have not been fossilized. Um, we can say that we're fairly confident this was the case because by the second state of the old division, numerous families of bryozoa are already around, suggesting something of a cryptic radiation within this group amongst those soft-bodied ta taxa. Since then, the group has been uh, around throughout the, uh, the Phanerozoic, and we can divide the group into two major clades with a bit of a switchover 
in diversity between the two in the Mesozoic. So you can see this switchover occurring in the Mesozoic here, and we've lost quite a lot of the diversity in one of those two clades. We often find the Viazoa based on my experience as these nice net-like fossils or fragments thereof um, within rocks. Uh, this is what I tend to recognize as a Briozoan from the field. And indeed, if you see something like this, um, it's a fairly good bet that you're looking at a Briozoan. But you may want to remember that there is actually a wide diversity of forms of these creatures as shown in the other images here in the fossil record. Um, so just be aware that, that that variety exists. Let's move onwards and let's look at the annelids. So the annelids are a group of segmented worms. They're familiar because earthworms are annelids, right? So these are um, land-based, so terrestrial annelids, but they're actually a really diverse phylum um, with uh, a whole bunch of um, different members in both land-based and um, marine ecosystems. And they've got, I think, arguably a, a surprisingly good fossil record for what is essentially a bunch of soft-bodied worms. These creatures generally move by either peristalsis, so that's the kind of mode of locomotion that you see in the earthworms, if you ever um, dig one of those up, or through undulations in their bodies. As I've already mentioned, they occupy a wide range of habitats from the deep sea all the way through to the mountainous landscapes of our continents. So this, this wide range of different um, um, environments, and that's matched by a wide range of different lifestyles and feeding habits from deposit feeding through to predation. They're mainly um, informal, so they mainly live within the sediment. Um, indeed, uh, to, to uh, kind of um, illustrate that point, uh, I was fascinated to learn that there are some um, groups of annelids whose uh, stru the, the burrow of their structures encourages the growth of bacteria. So there are even some groups of annelid uh, that engage in farming as a way of, um, of living their lives. That's pretty damn cool, isn't it? I thought so. Um, annelid worms are again um, in a part of the tree, as you can see here, where I didn't actually want to commit to the relationships between these taxa, because this is a part of the tree that's actually in a, a state of flux right now. Some of the latest phylogenies suggest that the annelid worms could be the sister group to our mollusks. And we're, we're relatively more confident uh, nowadays that they are a member of this group, the Lophotrochozoa. However, um, where exactly they sit in that group relative to some of the, um, the other clays that I've um, not included in this tree remain matters of active research. So just bear that in mind, but probably Lothotrochozoa. So as I said, their fossil record is actually surprisingly good for a load of soft-bodied animals. Um, so that's good. Uh, but what that equates to, because they are soft-bodied, is that that's a fairly sporadic fossil record. Um, it ranges from the early Cambrian all the way through to the recent, um, and many fossil species are associated with fossil lagerstatten. So if you remember our very first introductory lecture, which in COVID times seems like a very long time ago now, um, these sites of exceptional preservation uh, are, are typically where we find our, uh, our really nice annelid fossils. They appear um, kind of fleetingly in these deposits. Uh, those deposits include the Burgess Shale. There are two examples of annelids from the Burgess Shale shown on the left here, and from um, other environment, uh, environments and times, such as the Maison Creek, uh, which is a carboniferous um, site of exceptional preservation where fossils are preserved within nodules of siderite or iron carbonate. So we've got this patchy record of exceptional preservation within this group, but there are, are a few groups with hard parts that are relatively well known and have quite a good, certainly Paleozoic fossil record. These include the Macaridians, uh, three families characterized by a skeleton of disarticulated calcite plates. These were previously uh, fairly enigmatic creatures. No one knew where they sat on the tree of life because we were used to finding these plates. But as of a paper in 2008 by my colleague Jakob Winter and colleagues, um, we now know that these are probably uh, annelids, and that's based on some lovely Ordovician fossils that Jakob described in, in this piece of work, which actually placed these plates within a context for us, suggesting that they were um, the plates of annelids. 
Many residues of acid etched Paleozoic rocks, so these are, are rocks that have been dissolved by acid etching, include skeletodonts. So these are th the, um, the, the mouth parts or jaws of ancient annelids shown here in this image. And these range from about 0.1 to about two millimeters in size. So they're actually what we tend to call microfossils. You'll have an entire lecture on those, but this is a kind of a, um, a functional category of just really small fossils. Doesn't really relate to the tree of life in any way. Um, and they're abundant and diverse in many horizons through the uh, Paleozoic. And for that reason, they can be quite useful as mic microfossils. I wanted to finish by highlighting the serpulids. You can see a living serpulid here, and these are a family of sessile uh, annelid worms. They're actually a, a group of the annelids called the, the polychaetes, or they're members of a group of the annelids called the polychaetes, I should say, that build tubes that, uh, in which they live. Those tubes are made of calcium carbonate, and as such, they have a very good preservation potential, and they're found from the Permian onwards. Um, it's because they have this good preservation potential, they're not uncommon in the fossil record. Um, so you can see here a, um, a clam or a bivalve um, upon which there are lots and lots of these circulid worms encrusting. And these are the tubes in which these individual worms live their lives. So that's what circulid worms look like. Or, or their tubes, I should say, I suppose, in the fossil record. And there, there again, they're relatively common. So if you ever see that, you can say that right there, that's a circulid worm. I've certainly seen them in field work in, uh, in Dorset quite a lot. And that's it from the uh, groups we missed part one. In our next video, part two, we're going to be looking at a few more groups that I've not had the time to talk about. So I'll see you there in just a short while. See ya.